Hi, this is AC's 8-Bit Zone. This episode is about graphic sprites. In this series, we'll see sprites, animation, and making video games. The year was 1982, and a novel era of home computers was going strong. Graphics were colorful, simple, and two-dimensional. Many games were based upon a fixed background that mostly changed only after the player cleared each level. A lot of animation and action occurred in the foreground with the motion and color of sprites. Sprites varied in size, speed, and complexity, but primarily they embodied your character and the enemies or obstacles, and maybe a missile, a ball, or some other flying object. Which were the best home computers in the Americas for sprites? Not all US computers supported sprite generation cleanly and with low overhead. Many computers required sprites to be drawn in line with the background scene. This was a software intensive process that ate up many instruction cycles. Moving bytes from dual buffers, combining sprite data with that background data, all this processing placed overhead on the processor. However, some great home computers provided dedicated hardware that offloaded most of the work from the microprocessor. Maybe you remember some of these home computers. Here are the top four on my list. Texas Instruments TI-99 4A. It arrived in 1981 and could display up to 32 sprites on the screen at one time. However, each sprite was limited to only one color. Commodore 64. It was released in 1982 and it could display up to 8 sprites on the screen thanks to the VIC-2 chip. Advanced programming techniques allowed to display more than 8 at a time. Each sprite could use one color or up to three colors if you were okay with having only half of the horizontal resolution. The Atari 800XL and the 8-bit series. The earliest Atari 8-bit arrived in 1979. The Sprite engine, the Antic chip, could display up to eight sprites in one color each. Again, advanced techniques could increase the apparent number of sprites that are in play. And finally, number four, the Tandy Radio Shack Color Computer. <laughs> well, wait, not really. The Coco 1, 2, and 3 all lacked dedicated hardware for sprites. However, the strengths of the Coco 3 overcame most of this limitation. We'll see during this series that even the Coco 1 and 2 can support some sprites with a little extra help. We'll work from software sprites all the way to hardware. What is a sprite actually? The C64 user's manual defines them this way. A sprite is a high-resolution programmed object that can be made into just about any shape through basic commands. The object can be easily moved around the screen by simply telling the computer the position the sprite should be moved to. Further, their color can be changed. You can tell if one object collides into another. They can be made to go in front of and behind one another, and they can be easily expanded in size. Now let's set the stage for what's to come. Let's draw a background to work within. I'll use this Pac-Man grid throughout the video series as we develop sprites, animation, and even a playable game. With the background in place, we can use the simplest animation technique. Draw, erase, move, redraw, and repeat the sequence. It doesn't look so great, does it? It flickers, and it's slow. These first techniques will be easy to code in BASIC, but they're very limited by the slow execution of BASIC. Improvements will come later by moving into machine language. You'll be floored by the difference. Putting aside the flicker problem for now, let's work on speed. The BASIC commands GET and PUT deal with a rectangular area of screen data. This program uses get twice, once to capture the object's pixels, and then again to capture a blank area. 
Then we can put the object rectangle, followed by putting the blanking rectangle. Here's what that looks like. It does show some improvement, but it still flickers. The syntax we just used with get and put made sure the capture and populate was done accurately, but it's slow because it had to account for these byte fragments. Here's what I mean by that. The sprite is located within these XY coordinates, but notice where the byte boundaries live. The machine language that underlies the basic commands had to deal with all these byte manipulations, preserving the surroundings in the background that were within some of the same bytes as the sprite itself in the foreground. But watch what happens if we allow the program to ignore the bit offsets. Now we're running at speed, but notice how it's erasing some of the background as it moves around the maze. Again, when we move into machine language, we'll be able to overcome these challenges. The Coco graphics screen is 256 bits wide by 192. That works out to 6 kilobytes of RAM. Fortunately for us, the Coco screen is drawn in byte order from RAM. That makes it easy to calculate a sprite location. In two-color mode, a pixel is a single bit that is either on or off. In four-color mode, two bits make up the pixel. Zooming into a small section of the 256 by 192 pixels, suppose we have a black background for our space scene. This area is 3 bytes wide, or 24 pixels, by 16 pixels tall. All these pixel bits are set to zero. On the horizon, we place some terrain that will be part of the background. The sprite will be placed in front. Here's a spaceship sprite above the terrain. Let's visualize the byte boundaries. We'll need to modify any bytes that the sprite lands in. The sprite data is kept in full bytes so that masking operations are quick. This is a good time to point out the need for a sprite mask for each position within the byte. There are four possible bit positions. We also use an inverse mask of the sprite to operate on the background. Anywhere we want to keep the background pixels, the bit values are 1. And anywhere the sprite pixels will land, these bits are zeros. Anytime we want to move the sprite, We'll combine these operations together as follows. We begin with a clean section of the background scene. The first operation uses a logical AND to combine each bit of the background with each bit of the background mask. And it results in the background being zeroed everywhere that the sprite will live. Step 2. We combine that with the logical OR of the sprite mask. This places the sprite in front of the background. This data is now ready to be moved into the video RAM. Well, this has been the introduction to sprites. In the next video, we'll get into machine language and we'll get much higher performance out of our sprites. From there, we'll move into animation and the making of video games.